Welcome back everyone. In this lecture we're going to look at the final set of critical approaches to the study of international relations, namely feminist approaches. So let's get started. You'll recall that I emphasized that feminism was not a single unitary theory but a collection of diverse theories centered on the analysis of the role and position of women in international relations. Liberal feminist approaches look very different from those of Marxist feminists, which look at the world in a different way than standpoint feminists, and so on. So what unites them? Feminist approaches to IR are united in their analysis and critique of the system of patriarchy and global politics. Feminist approaches to the study of IR gained traction in the late 1980s and focus on the ways in which the function of global politics, economic security, foreign policy development, and all of the other subfields were gendered. In its simplest form, feminist approaches to IR ask the question, where are the women? And it's easy to see why they ask this question. We'll look at critical feminist approaches in just a moment. Many of those approaches are dismissive of liberal feminism, which focuses simply on the inclusion of women in decision-making processes and leadership positions. But we shouldn't be too quick even to dismiss this simple goal. A project by LUK photoshopped the men out of politics with some stark results. Here we have U.S. military leadership on their way to brief the Senate on U.S. strategy to address the rise of the Islamic State. And when we remove the men, it gets pretty lonely. The British House of Commons, roughly equivalent to the U.S. House of Representatives before, and again after, is pretty quiet. Unless we think that U.S. politics would look any different, here's a meeting of President Obama's Executive Committee of the National Security Council during the raid that killed Osama bin Laden, and without the men. And finally, a meeting of the heads of state of the British Commonwealth before and after. According to a 2016 report by the United Nations, only about 22% of all national parliamentarians globally are women. This is an improvement from 1995, when only about 11% were, but still a long way from half, which is what the population distribution suggests it should be. And for liberal feminists, this is not just a matter of equity and fairness, but one of more sound policy making as well. People of diverse backgrounds, including racial and gender diversity, bring different experiences, information, concerns, and interests to the fore in decision-making processes. Indeed, a whole line of research and leadership studies shows that diverse groups make better decisions. A report by the consulting firm McKinsey, for example, showed that companies with greater racial and gender diversity in management positions generated higher profitability than less diverse companies. That said, the critique offered by feminist IR scholars is that the practice of international relations has excluded women, and that women bear a disproportionate share of the negative consequences of foreign military and economic policy. Feminist IR thus seeks to overturn that bias in theory and practice by bringing issues of central concern to women more squarely into the framework of analysis. Before moving on to that analysis, though, it's necessary to briefly ensure we're all on the same page with respect to some key concepts for feminist theory. The first, and perhaps most foundational, is the distinction between biological sex and gender. Remember that sex refers to the biological and physiological differences between men, women, or intersex individuals, while gender refers to the social constitution of those differences. Feminist IR scholars emphasize that gender distinctions are not natural, but are socially constructed and reflective of cultural differences. Those social constructions naturalize a sexual division of labor, establish social hierarchies, and serve to value or devalue particular individuals and perspectives. Feminist IR scholars emphasize that while sex is a biological category, gender is a social construct and therefore not neutral. The social construction of gender varies across time and space. However, given the dominance of European perspectives in the contemporary world system, the criticism offered by feminist IR scholars are directed primarily at that understanding. Some of the most well-known feminist IR scholars thus offer critiques of both the theory and practice of international relations. One of the earliest was Carol Cohn, whose groundbreaking article Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals, published in 1987, problematized the language of nuclear war. For Cohn, the language and imagery used by defense professionals was imbued with a sexualized subtext that domesticated and dehumanized the cost of war, allowing defense professionals to discuss war without ever thinking about the real costs. At the same time, such language also served, according to Cohn, as a way of dismissing or silencing voices from outside. 
The most obvious example of this is the use of the term collateral damage to replace loss of human life, but there are countless other examples as well. Sexualized language, according to Cohn, included vertical erector launchers, thrust to weight ratios, soft laydowns, deep penetrations, and orgasmic wumps. Even India's acquisition of the nuclear bomb was described as India losing her virginity. When William Lawrence, a reporter for the New York Times, described the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki on August 9, 1945, he described it as follows. Then, just when it appeared as though the thing had settled down into a state of permanence, there came a shooting out of the top of a giant mushroom that increased in size of the pillar to a total of 45,000 feet. The mushroom top was even more alive than the pillar, seething and boiling in a white fury of creamy foam, sizzling upward and then descending earthward, a thousand geysers rolled into one. It kept struggling in an elemental fury, like a creature in the act of breaking the bonds that held it down. All of this sexualized language, according to Cohn, normalizes war by removing the human cost, reinforces structural violence against women, and simultaneously excludes women from positions of leadership or influence in that area. Lawrence's account sanitizes the real cost of war, writing out the estimated 40 to 80,000 people killed on the day of the attack, half of whom suffered acute radiation poisoning for up to a month before they finally died or the fact that women and children and the elderly were disproportionately among those killed, or the fact that only about 200 of those killed at Nagasaki were actually Japanese soldiers. Feminist IR approaches thus center the analysis, focusing on those without voice in global politics, and drawing attention to the unequal distribution of the costs of war around the world. Feminist IR theory also focuses on the gender dynamics of power in the economy. Cynthia Enloe's Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, published in 1990, was one of the first and most influential works in this respect. Drawing on case studies from tourism, colonialism, military bases, diplomatic spouses, textile workers, migrant domestic workers, and others, Enloe focuses on two key questions. First, how the work performed by women in the global economy is both central to its maintenance and simultaneously undervalued by it. As scholars who followed Enloe's analysis observed, economic change in the global political economy has a differential impact on women than it does on men. Cuts to state spending in education, health care, social security, and other areas frequently impact women's employment. They also affect women's workload, since women are often more responsible for reproduction, the maintenance uh, and social reproduction of the household, and other domestic tasks. Similarly, women are disproportionately subject to poverty and disproportionately affected by economic downturns. And second, Enloe's analysis draws attention to the work performed by women in international politics and forces us to reconsider assumptions about what international relations is all about. Traditional international relations tended to focus on issues of high politics, that is, issues of foreign policy and security. So-called low politics, sometimes also called soft politics, of humanitarian or economic concerns were relegated to secondary positions. Enloe and other feminist IR scholars helped break that down, drawing attention to these neglected areas and focusing on the ways in which the issues of international relations play out in the real world and in the real lives of people. And for many feminists, this embodied the adage that the personal is political. Feminist scholars have also added the concept of intersectionality to our analysis of social and political phenomena in international relations. The concept of intersectionality comes out of the work of Black and Chicana feminist thought and was originally articulated by Kimberly Crenshaw. Crenshaw, who drew on work of previous theorists like Bell Hooks and Gloria Anzadula, argued that it was impossible to understand the experience of Black women solely through feminist politics. Rather, it was the intersection of multiple identities that includes race, class, gender, sexual orientation, national origin, and so on, that define the experiences of people within systems of power, and that these interlocking systems of power, racism, classism, sexism, transphobia, and so on, combine to mutually reinforce one another. Today, intersectional approaches try to unpack interlocking systems of power and oppression that impact the most marginalized and vulnerable in society. It posits that markers of identity do not exist independently of one another, but are rather woven together. The intersectional framework echoes Marxist feminist approaches to political economy, such as those advocated by Maria Mies and Vandana Shiva. For Marxist feminists, capitalism rests on the hyper-exploitation of women, 
particularly in the realm of social reproduction. Perhaps one of the most valuable contributions of intersectional feminist analysis in this respect is the way that it highlights the various intersections or webs of power in international relations. As noted previously, feminist IR scholars critique not just theories of international relations, but the practice of IR as well. And intersectional frameworks are particularly good for this, noting that while women are excluded from positions of authority and decision making, they're more likely to be illiterate, poor, killed at birth, or undernourished, that they earn less than their male counterparts and are more likely to live in poverty, and that these economic outcomes are not happenstance, but instead are reflective of broader gendered relations that structurally disadvantage women and serve to make them individually less secure. I said at the beginning of this lecture that there are a variety of feminist approaches to IR. Before concluding, I want to briefly highlight some of them and give you a sense of their differences. Remember that all feminist approaches share a concern with the question of exclusion of women from global politics and the emphasis of, on masculinity in international relations. That is, they share a conception of the world rooted in their analysis of patriarchy. From there, the approaches diverge. Liberal feminists have much in common with mainstream liberal approaches to IR. As noted earlier, they are primarily focused on questions of inclusion. They ask questions like, who's included and who's excluded in decision making? Are women's voices and experiences valued? And what aspects of life are considered or excluded from analysis? Marxist feminists draw extensively from other Marxist approaches and focus on the intersection of class and gender. They're focused on questions of exploitation and draw attention to the double work burden faced by women in societies around the world. Examples here include authors like Maria Mies and Vandana Shiva. Poststructural feminists draw on the work of constructivists and emphasize the fact that all identities are social constructions. They problematize gendered binaries, male-female, pro public-private, war-peace, and so on. Examples here include authors like Christine Sylvester and Judith Butler, who famously argues that gender is, quote, performative, whereby there is no pertinent conception of gender outside of the social construction of masculinity and femininity. And finally, postcolonial feminists, who critique other feminist approaches for their Eurocentric understanding of gender and femininity. Examples here include authors like Audre Lorde and Chandra Mohanty, who argues in her seminal work, Under Western Eyes, that Western feminists construct women in the post-colonial world as passive victims of male control who need to be saved by Western women. Well, that does it for our brief consideration of feminist approaches to IR. Be sure to watch other videos covering critical theories of international relations. Thanks, everyone. Bye.